Viewer discretion is advised for this video, as some of this video may be offensive or disturbing. We, the makers of this video, in no way support or promote the choices, decision, and lifestyle of narco criminals. Gorgeous but deadly, Sandra Avila Petran grew up surrounded by piles of cash in a drug lord's household. She was one of the few women who made it to the top and managed to keep their place in the upper echelons of the Mexican drug world since the late 1970s. She lived, worked, and loved to make a name as a drug trafficker and proudly owns her moniker, the Queen of the Pacific, or La Reina del Pacifico. Welcome to Nutty History, and today we will be exploring the untold story of the woman who became the face and voice of Mexican drug trafficking, Sandra Avila Beltran, the Queen of the Pacific. Avila was only 13 years old when she witnessed her first shootout. It was cartel meets Hollywood as it could be. People walked down the streets with weapons, hunting their targets, as musicians followed them playing songs at dawn. According to Avila, the music at sunrise meant someone was gonna die. For a time, Avila had no intention to join the family business. While she was still in high school, her childhood friends were rising through the ranks of the Sinaloa cartel. But she wanted to be a journalist. At the age of 21, she was pursuing a degree in communications at Universidad Autonoma de Guadalajara when a jealous ex-boyfriend kidnapped her. Like her family, her ex was also a powerful member of the cartel. The incident changed her perspective on life, and after being rescued, she abandoned the dream of becoming an investigative journalist. Within months, Avila left town and entered the world to become a drug trafficker, like everyone else in her family. It was pretty much in her blood. She was a third-generation drug trafficker. And not just any drug trafficker, she was an heir to an empire. Now, it wouldn't be wrong to say that Avila was born into narco royalty to Maria Luisa Beltran Felix and Alfonso Avila Quintero. Alfonso was related to Rafael Caro Quintero, one of the founding members of the Guadalajara cartel. Avila's family also had a strong kinship with the Beltran Leva brothers from her mother's side, who were involved in smuggling smack and, obviously later, diversified into Snow White. According to officials, Avila was also the goddaughter of Miguel Callado Felix, a.k.a. El Patrino. With such a legacy, she spent so many hours counting cash as a child that she could later swipe a clutch of bills and, like a cocktail party trick, precisely calculate their value. Her love for money was immense at the height of her career. She had the propensity to carry suitcases with millions of dollars in crisp $100 bills. She was also a raucous car driver, a skilled horseback rider, and a prodigy when it came to sharpshooting. She was also a master of the art of flirting, which was irresistible for her targets given her beauty and charms. At a young age, she received a private education instead of attending school publicly and learned how to dance and play piano, all of which helped her to win hearts easily. When she decided to join the drug business, she chose her mark perfectly. During her 22nd year life, Avila was secretly meeting with Amado Carillo Fuentes, also known as Lord of the Skies. Soon, her life was all about being a full-time member of the cartel. She was an astute learner and rose fast through the ranks. Not to mention, she was coveted by men every step of the way, which did help her cause. There have been very few women that managed to climb to the top of the drug trafficking business. Now, according to Avila, in the world of drugs, women are taken advantage of, discarded, and tossed out with no regret. Usually, women are nothing more than a status symbol for narcos. So even if one was part of a drug dynasty, not being a male posed a lot of hindrance in their path to being taken seriously as a trafficker. The first thing Avila promised to herself was never to consume Snow White herself. According to her, the moment a woman would do Snow White, she would lose respect in the eyes of her peers. Avila, on the other hand, knew that to rise in the rank as a woman, she would need to be respected by everyone. She was not there to be another player, but to be a leader, a queen. Avila worked harder than everybody to be coronated. She peddled her charms, terminated the rivals, and made the right connections to become the key link between Mexican and Colombian cartels, including her most recent boyfriend, Juan Diego Espinosa Ramirez, a.k.a. El Tigre, of the Colombian Norte de Valle cartel. She was also careful not to leave any evidence on crime scenes so that the crime could be traced back to her. It not only helped her to evade authorities, but it also helped the rumors to fly around cartels about the extent of her capabilities. She smuggled tons of Snow White hidden in tuna boats from Mexico to the United States for years to be dubbed the Queen of the Pacific. She allied herself with El Chapo Guzman, 
dated a top leader of the Sinaloa cartel, married twice, and both of her husbands were ex-police commanders who became drug traffickers for her. They both died, one of multiple bullet wounds, another punctured through the heart during Mexico's ongoing Snow White-related gang wars. And now Avila has an altar and a candle-crowded shrine in memory of both of them and her brother too, who was wasted for the same cause. Raking in uncountable millions of dollars, she had fully embraced the decadent narco lifestyle. Her assets included a fleet of 30 or more cars, a gold Tutankhamun pendant with 83 rubies, 228 diamonds, and 189 sapphires. Her three-decade rise to power was made possible by one single magic ingredient, non-stop massive bribes to Mexican public officials. During her glory days, Avila was provided with a front-row view of private jets, clandestine plastic surgery operations to disguise her identity, and more slains and carnages at VIP parties. For her son's 15th birthday, she gifted him a Hummer and spoiled her kids with $40,000 quarterly allowances. Her lifestyle, captured in images, was grand enough to give Keeping Up with the Kardashians a run for its money. The only exception was characters in her life being terminated, often either because of gang wars or thanks to the actions taken by authorities. But losing friends and allies didn't deter her a bit. At her peak, Avila was pretty much invincible. Even when she eventually got caught, she lived out her prison stay with designer clothes and multiple maids made possible by her extraordinary wealth. She was turned into the stuff of legends with songs such as Fiesta en la Sierra by Los Tucanes de Tijuana and La Reina del Sur by Los Tigres del Norte. These songs described her as the lady boss of the drug empire, who arrives at mountaintop parties by helicopter, brandishing an AK-47 in her hand instead of a mirror and powder. Nothing stays forever. No matter how much success you achieve, it all comes undone one day, especially if that success is riddled with blood, drugs, and other crimes. Avita's luck, too, took a turn in 2002. Just like her road to success began with a kidnapping, it reached a dead end with kidnapping as well. Her son was abducted that year, and she had to pay a ransom of $5 million to get him back. But the whole incident did more harm to her than to her son. It brought her out of the shadows. Police intensified their scrutiny, and now Avila was featured on Most Wanted posters instead of songs and fictional books. Sensing her time was up, Avila went on the run and managed to live for years as a fugitive. Avila barely escaped certain death in a street ambush orchestrated by her rivals while police were accounting for her wealth and assets to figure out how she became so rich. It wasn't long after that that her illegal activities and drug trafficking empire were out in the public. She had to live the next five years, constantly running, hiding, and looking over her shoulder as she changed houses and hair colors at the same frequency. Losing any semblance of a normal life, Avila, who never did any drugs in her life, got high on something else, adrenaline. The thrill of the chase was somewhat enjoyable and addicting for her. The same songs that once made her feel proud about herself were now reasons for her irritation. They exposed her to the entire world. During this hide-and-seek game with authorities, Avila met Juan Diego Espinosa in 2004, who helped her to get back into the business. But the hunt continued, and so Avila kept on running until there was nowhere to run. On September 27, 2007, Avila was caught by Mexican authorities along with her boyfriend, and she decided to surrender. Unlike her peers, who will be hit in the back for running or hit in the head for fighting back. It was a surreal but relieving experience for her that the chase was over. For much of the next decade, she lived behind bars, even though the Mexican government couldn't pin any drug charges on Avila. However, the money laundering charges got her convicted. Of course, prison time for a wealthy cartel leader in Mexico is slightly different than it is for the average inmate. Avila's prison stay was lavish and stylish. She said with a conspiring smirk, money buys everything in Mexico. Thanks to the infamously corrupt system, Avila would welcome visitors decked out in high heels, jewelry, and designer clothes. Her cell was also facilitated with three maids to serve her and her guests, food, cigarettes, and alcohol. The guards were not there to discipline her, but to act as her bodyguards, with an air of a low-ranking diplomat treating Avila as their diplomat. On August 10, 2012, 
she was extradited to answer for criminal charges by the U.S. government, even though she asserted every time she was asked about her crimes that she was just a housewife making money on the side selling jewelry and clothes, she accustomed herself to the harsher prison conditions in the United States, all the more so when she was thrown into solitary confinement. She had to survive in isolation for nearly two years, and she did that by reviving her journalistic dream. Listening to the radio in her cell, she covered and opined on elections in Venezuela and both Obama campaigns. Scribbling in notebooks, she would make predictions about elections, mock the futility of drug probation, criticize Mexican politicians' corruption, and celebrate the escape of her old friend, Joaquin El Chapo Guzman. Eventually, Avila was released in 2015, but her fortune is mostly buried and she had a task force of lawyers fighting the legal battle for her 15 homes, 30 sports cars, and an estimated 300 pieces of jewelry. Even though she was out of the industry now, she doesn't think the legalization of certain drugs would change anything, and there will always be something to make the next generation of narcos prosper. Tell us in the comments, was seven years of incarceration just enough for someone like Sandra Avila Petran? Or what would, in your opinion, cause the end of narcos? As always, thanks for watching Nutty History.